I think Foxtrot was, uh, we were gaining confidence. You know, live was going very well at that point, even though, you know, financially things weren't good, but there was a, a, a great rapport building um, and uh, it was beginning to sort of move around other countries. And so I think we were confident in, in a way that we hadn't been before. Um, and so that gave us the, uh, if you like, mental uh, platform on which to build something like Supper's Ready, which is still one of the things that I like best uh, looking backwards. I think going to Foxtrot was, well, we were pretty confident in what we'd written and everything. I think it was, we had trouble with um, engineers and producers on this. Uh, I think Charisma were very keen for us to use this guy, Bob Potter, who had worked with uh, Lindisfarne. And because uh, they wanted us to sound, I don't know what they wanted really, but they wanted the voice louder, I think was what they wanted more than anything else. And they, they thought a real producer coming in might be something, the sort of thing we had. So. We went into the studio with this guy, Bob Potter, and um, and I played, you know, we started recording stuff, and I played the opening to Watch of the Skies. He said, I don't like that. I don't think we should use that. So I thought, oh, God, here we go, you know. And so, and yeah, I must say, well, there's no way. And he, we tried a couple of other things, and he was, you know, okay as, a, as an engineer and everything. It was fine. It was good engineer, actually. Nothing wrong with that. But the fact that he didn't like what we were doing um, meant that we couldn't couldn't work with him. So we had to, we got rid of him and ended up working with just the engineer um, and in fact we changed engineers in the middle of the song because the engineer we were working with we weren't too sure about him either. We recorded the first half of Supper's Ready with this other engineer and then we got this other guy John Burns came in as the next engineer and we finished off the song with him and did the rest of the album with him. Well I was fairly shattered at that time and um, you know we'd done a lot of touring and um, I think every now and again I would threaten to leave and so would Phil and luckily on day one of recording of Foxtrot Mike and Tony sat me down and said we don't want you to leave Steve we really like your guitar playing. Now strange as it seems I hadn't really understood that at that point I didn't because you know it was I think there was a stiff upper lip thing in the band you know we didn't sort of compliment each other very much um, and um, so I felt very insecure as one of the new boys, and I thought, well, I'd better to leave before I get sacked. Um, but, you know, this was a revelation to me. And I think there was lots of great stuff on, on Foxtrot, so I'm pleased they asked me to stay. From the way we worked, I guess, was, you know, we were playing all the time, and we would when we weren't playing, we would rehearse, you know, and write. And, uh, and we tried to get blocks of writing time, but I can't remember whether we managed to do much more than a week in Woolwich and a week in even a Billings or a week in some of it was done in um, oh, Chessington so we had a friend who had a friend who had a house so we moved in there to do a bit of it I think I know certainly Selling England was done there but um, we did we did it all over the place and and we had moved on from Nursery Crime. We were playing lots of gigs. We were very, very good live by this point. Obviously, Steve had, well, Steve had come on for the Nursery Crime, but, but we were very much a band, a better band. On the whole, this, this album is one that, um, you know, it's probably my favourite of the, uh, you know, there's a totality of, of the early albums, I think. I just think it's got sort of... We really came of age of this album, I think, and it, it was almost, it almost got, it got to number 12 on the charts, which was a staggering thing for us. So we, we were quite excited by that. In my mind, this is a, is a much stronger album than uh, Nursery Crime, than the first one. I think it's, obviously, Summer's Ready is a huge piece, which we would get on to, I think it was one of our best moments, but I think generally, the, you know, it opens with that Watches of the Sky sound, which I remember, I remember hearing Tony playing the first, those chords sometimes. In a, on an Italian tour, one of these big sort of palace sports with echoes booming around, it sounded fantastic. Um, the band's getting some, 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 some darkness, I think, um, more so in, in, into the music. Um, I look back and watch the sky, it's got a fantastic intro. The rhythm's great. I think the words are a bit suspect. They're kind of okay. Tony and I wrote them. But like, looking back, it's a little too busy. But I mean, I think that uh, that rhythm, bum 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 bum, was a nice sort of 
great groove under those chords. Sadly now your thoughts turn to the stars Where we have gone you know you never can go Watcher of the Skies was a very important track to us and although I think Tony was the sort of lead writer uh, on that with you know, particularly the um, uh, Mellotron chords and um, and I did some work, I think, on the on the verses and chorus, but the the vibe was um, uh, sci-fi meets prog, I think. Seems funny to say it now, but I, you know, I was still going to see Yes every Wednesday at the Marquee, and still trying to bring a little bit of that musicianship into the band. That they kind of tricky arrangements that they used to have, and I used to. So, so it's a shame we can't do stuff like that. So I think Watch of the Skies. Ended up. Certainly, the intro is all Tony, of course, but that's a da 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 You know, that was kind of probably came from somewhere near my drum end. I remember writing it with Tony Banks sitting on a roof initially outside a hotel bedroom window. There was a sort of tile roof second there, and looking at it, and there was no one around, sort of thing, sort of lunar landscape. And you know, it's not good to criticise things, which I often do, because these are period pieces. You know, and, and as the years go by, I think I've learnt to, you can't just use the words you want to say, they've got to sing well. And these are interesting words, but they didn't sing very well. Watcher of the Sky, Watcher All, it's a stiff lyric. Um, but a good musical song, yeah. Walking across the sitting room, I turn the television off. We always started each album, I did, with a degree of trepidation and excitement, a bit like, well, this is the new one, let's see what we've got here, but I know, a bit like, will it be good, will it work, you know? Um, but I think albums in Mama seem to alternate. Nursery Grime, I think, was a bit hard to write for me. Foxtrot was easy. I think we were writing better together as a group. I mean, a lot of the stuff, individual you know, stuff, was still there. Um, you know, uh, you would come into the group, I mean, I tend to remember on this album, you come in with ideas, a riff or something, and like I mentioned, the beginning of Supper's Ready, but also that applies to, you know, what became the end section of Supper's Ready. It was another thing I'd written, in fact, the thing I'd written on guitar at university, as it turned out, the Sure as Eggs is Eggs thing. And so you had these sort of quite specific bits, like Willow Farm was Peters and things, and we had these quite big just chunks that were all written by people, kind of put them all in the same song, and then it was the kind of filling out stuff that almost ended up being the strongest stuff, though you know, like the Apocalypse part, which was something that really was Mike, um, Phil and I just wrote, you know, wrote that improvising, working out a big keyboard solo together and, and the sort of way of playing it. Um, so, yes, I mean, I think we were writing well as a group together. And then the individual bits that came in, you know, where we just developed them more. I was very free with them. But sometimes, you know, in the early days, perhaps, well, with the song Timetable, for example, I came in with a complete piece and just said, right, this is it, and we did it. Uh, whereas someone like Supper, um, Get Em Up by Friday, I just had this sort of this riff, this dang, 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 dang thing, and played it to them, and then we sort of developed it as a group. And that was sort of, uh, in a sense, was more interesting, I think, and that's why, you know, so I think, I, I think it both ways work, but I think they're slightly more interesting when, when, you, when the group can all feel they're involved in the composition. It tends to pr produce a better result. I think Supper's Ready was, again, one of these journey songs where we really try to take people into the, along this dream um, dr dream journey and uh, um, when it worked and we got to the sort of New Jerusalem stuff at the end you could really feel people uh, you were touching people um, in a quite a deep way and it was um, there was a guy who'd uh, <clears throat> been Edith Piaf's promoter in Paris, I remember, and when he heard Supper's Ready for the first time, he invited us to perform it um, at his church in Normandy. And, uh, and this was a guy who didn't normally relate to rock music. It was more the sort of Piaf era and tradition. Um, and there were things like that, that, that were sort of growing in the music that sometimes you get a feeling and get a um, an area that was you could harvest in different ways and uh, um, 
and I think capture people's imagination. We weren't quite sure what we'd written really until we heard it back because we'd sort of heard this long thing. We decided we were really going to go for the long one this time because we'd done Musical Box and Stagnation. And I thought, well, let's just go for a, go for one whole side of an album, you know, 26 minutes, and 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 see what we can do. And we got these ideas. And we actually sort of put bits and pieces in this the thing. I mean, this song had started off just like, just like Stagnation really, in a way. I had this guitar piece I'd written, which um, we sort of I thought was a really strong opening part. You know, which was kind of first two or three minutes of the song was based on this this part and um, and we started doing a thing on it and got the sort of melody and everything. it was sounding really good and we're carrying on and it was developing you know between little tinkly bits after that and all the rest of it and a few vocal bits and I thought that if we do this could just be ending up sounding exactly like musical box we're not careful you know so I said well let's let's just stop the song you know just we had a really romantic but I said let's just stop the song now and go straight into this other piece we have which is Willow Farm which is the thing that Peter had written so let's just go in there you've got this really pretty bit and this really ugly chord sequence suddenly coming in after that should sound great and so we did that and then when we that suddenly took the whole song to another dimension you know suddenly the drums were in everything was going and the second half of the song becomes very electric and you know and I think produced what was our best piece of composition during the uh, the the period with Peter, which was the, the latter part of Supper's Ready, particularly from the, the Apocalypse in 9-8 onwards. It was just, uh, and it was a coincidence to some extent what happened there again. It was another of those places where I'd, I had, this, uh, had a keyboard solo and it ended on these big chords and I thought, yeah, just big chords, you know. I had this idea of just sort of vocal harmonies going, ah, you know. And, and then again, Peter started singing on top of it, you know. And, and I thought, oh, shit, here he goes again, you know. And I thought, and I heard it back. It really didn't take me very long this time. I thought, that sounds fantastic. And, and, and it was really was the, the real peak, you know. You sort of had this long build up with this um, keyboard solo, uh, which sort of like starts very sweet and then gets slightly more sinister. And then it suddenly this big chord comes in, and then six 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 comes in like that. Incredibly strong moment, I think. And I think for um, for the early fans, it was the, the big moment. And on stage, it was tremendous. You know, it was a really really strong moment, I think. And Supper's Ready was. Um, it needed all the extra stuff at the front, it's like foreplay. You had to have all that stuff at the front to get to that one moment, I think, and then from then on it kind of really delivers. So it was, uh, I, I was very proud of that. When we first heard it back, having done, written it and recorded it, we never hadn't heard it all back, we actually stuck it together. And Mike and I going to another studio, because we ran out of studio time, and actually sticking these two parts together, which incidentally actually was slightly out of tune, so we had to do this sort of little funny little slowed down the track in order to make it work, which we were able to rectify this on, the, on the remixes, obviously. And, uh, and just hearing it back, all is one thing. I thought, this is fantastic. This, this is so much the best thing we've ever done. I'm really excited by this. So that was a very strong moment. <laughs> funny is because it's not you know it's not kind of quoted as much as it as, as it used to be I mean back in the in the 70s you know I remember they used to have these sort of polls you know I remember on on uh, it was Nicky Horn's show on Capital Radio you know and the, the number one sort of rock track of all time was Stairway to Heaven inevitably I suppose but the number two is Supper's Ready you know well that wouldn't happen now and one of the reasons for that I think is because Supper's Ready it never gets played because it's too long no radio station is going to play a song that's 26 minutes long is it really so uh, and that applies even in England. So it's uh, it's kind of it's not really known about much by people apart from people who, who who know the group and like the group, you know, and who bought the album, I suppose, and, and the live shows that we did with it. So it's uh, a little bit forgotten, but I think it's it was a very strong moment, you know. We we were always tempted to try and do it on stage, but it is 26 minutes of a show, and that's that's an awful lot to give over to one piece from that period. The, the big stuff on Supper is really like the big instrumental stuff. I th you know, I remember we were rehearsing at Una Billings School of Dance in Shepherd's Bush and I had something to do in the afternoon and I came back and Mike and Tony had written basically the Apocalypse in 9-8, you know, and that's what it ended up being called. This was just this riff, don't, 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 don't. And I said, ah, oh, sounds good. And um, Tony had written, not thinking about the time signature, he'd sort of written this keyboard thing and actually the thing was in 9-8. So I, I maybe played it once or twice, but never really thought about it too much. And of course, we went in to record it, still not really knowing what it was. But it was just like one of those moments where the tape was playing and recording, and and it was just captured. You know, that's one of our best, probably one of our best um, spontaneous moments. I still listen to that and can't quite work out, you know, how, 
how it just all happened at the right time. So. And also the last bit, you know, New Jerusalem, I think that's fantastic. So that's probably um, my favourite song on that It's one. funny, looking back, the way it happened, it was never like you knew what you were doing. You know what I mean? We had a whole lot of bits and then we still started stringing together. And the, it's the first time it happened like this, the second half, you know, the sort of keyboard solo to the end, was really, it showed a bit more of a freedom. You know what I mean? The keyboard solo was just a, really myself, Phil and, and, and Tony and Steve just sort of jamming. Um, and Tony writing stuff over those, that riff we're just playing all the time down the bottom with no movement, so he can move around the chords a lot. Um, but the moment when we built to that 666 bit it was one of those few moments in, in your career where you actually got a great sounding thing and, and Pete um, came in with a, it's a vocal line we hadn't sung together. He laid it on top. He hadn't been rehearsing it like that way. He just came in, we imagined there'd be some singing there, or maybe not, and it sounded fantastic. I like it a bit to Mama. I think the middle eight of Mama and this bit have got similar things where just it, it's really one of those moments in your career when you go in and, and uh, Peter first of all and Phil later had laid this vocal down. It's just like fantastic, you know, so strong. So it shows a bit more freedom, you know, because we tend to write songs much more compact, lots of bits in it. Uh, whereas this was a bit freer, you know, you'd stay on a section for a bit longer and let things happen. What I've always loved about this business as a writer, and you learn it as you go along, is that there's luck. I mean, luck does come into it. Um, and things that seem quite effortless, as this was, are always good. You know, we weren't aware when we put it all together that we had a, a really strong thing, that it was good. Um, but things that happen without the feeling you're trying are often the best things, I think. And I think someone really felt, had that sort of feeling about it. I think we were beginning to, f to know who we were as writers and also know how to deliver it as performers. Um, whereas I think, so we were, it's a coming of age piece, I think, in lots of ways. It functioned like the introduction to Supper's Ready because um, it just went straight into Supper's Ready, so people just assumed it was part of Supper's Ready. That's that's fine, but it was it was at one minute thirty seconds of me coming up with something that was based on a on a Bach prelude, I think it was for for, for cello, um, and I was amazed that, that that the guys let me put it on the album. To be honest, um, I remember playing it to them in rehearsal one day, and Phil said, "It sounds like there ought to be applause at the end of it." Um, so, you know, I, I'm, thank you, Phil, for that, you know, because otherwise perhaps it wouldn't have made it onto the album. Um, it's very nice, you know, it's slightly sort of, um, I was thinking along the lines of Tudor composers like William Byrd writing short pieces like the Earl of Salisbury, very short pieces, one minute, 30 seconds, perfectly good enough for a, for a Tudor composer, but for rock and roll, in those days, nobody told you that you couldn't. Get Him Out by Friday was a song um, essentially about people being uh, um, kicked out of uh, rented accommodation. So there was, I think, some of the Rackman stories of, sort of bad landlords and that sort of thing. Um, and I put in a, a little extra thought there about uh, uh, evolving the species to shrink people so that with genetic engineering you might make people a lot shorter, which would mean you could get many more apartments in the same building. Um, and it was done, you know, as a sort of slight uh, comment on attitudes of uh, landlords to tenants, but um, there is actually, I think, a reasonable argument that when, when we are fully controlling our evolution uh, genetically, which I think we will be, um, maybe not in my lifetime, but in my children's lifetime, there may be a decision um, to go smaller. 
I mean, that's one way of using less of uh, nature's resources and, um, in all sorts of areas. So, um, get short might be a slogan <laughs> of the future. Part social comment, part prophetic. Get Out of Friday is a good song, I think, actually. A little example of where, I mean, great lyric, nice idea. An example of where something we did suffer from, we, we, had, we had too much stuff on a song. You know what I mean? The track was great without any vocals. It sounded good, but in fact, when the vocals came on, it's a very clever lyric and a great performance from Peter, it's almost too much in there. As the years tick by later on, you know, 10 years down the line, we, were, we started to realize that there's a danger in actually not getting the voice early on when you're actually playing tracks, because in a sense, you know, sometimes, in those days, we'd often do that track instrumentally, People go away and come back with the lyric sometimes and, and vocal ideas and hadn't sung much beforehand. Whereas, you know, sometimes in the later songs you can just play the chord of A for eight bars, which instrumentally sounds a bit boring, but when there's a great vocal on top, it really works. So we sort of had more space later on to let the voice do its thing. And this, this song suffered a bit from having just too many good ideas in it. Because there was nothing to sing at the time, Peter wouldn't necessarily sing. You know, he'd be playing his bass drum, he'd be playing his tambourine, he'd be playing a flute shouting something, singing something. We couldn't hear it because it was in a rehearsal room, no, not very you know, good PA. And we'd get these great things that actually sounded like instrumental things. And then he would go away and come back with a, a lyric. And it would be like be, it'd be so crowded, so dense, you know. Um, and the idea was great because this was like, you know, the idea of running short of space and property. So let's, let's try and get people to live, become smaller, you know. I think it was kind of roughly the gist. But, um, no, we did find that the downside to the way we were writing and the kind of just the technical hearing a voice at that stage meant that we would write these things and they would come back um, a little busy, a little, little dense, by which time it was too late. Because sometimes we'd recorded the backing tracks, you know. And then we'd say, okay, well, you go and write the lyrics for that, you go and write the lyrics for that, and then the lyrics would come back. And we put a vocal on, and it was like, <coughs> sometimes. The second best song is definitely Get Em Out by Friday for me on this album. I mean, I think that's a be much better song than Watch of the Sky. So the in introduction is a sort of, you know, is a kind of a bit of an iconic sort of piece, I suppose, with Genesis. But it's, um, yeah, people forget about the other ones. I mean, but I don't know. I know a lot of people who think Can You Still It in the Coastline? This is one of their favourite tracks, you know. So I think it, it's, I think every piece on this worked pretty well. It's strong. I mean, the, the end of the end section of Can You Still See is really good. I think it's sort of well, the first part's good. It's a nice, it's a really good song, and then we kind of it kind of it's just a bit fragmented that song. I think that's that's where it suffers slightly. But the, the last part is, is is a good instrumental piece as well. So you know, I, I just I said before, I, I feel this album is, is strong all the way through. I was less happy with this sleeve than I, I was with the, the first two. I think the style was losing some of its a, appeal to me, even though the, uh, uh, the Fox character, you know, I think worked. And then um, I'd had this sort of a Fox idea of uh, really, which would, was related to, I think, hunting and the hunted. And, you know, I was looking at all sorts of esoteric stuff and numerology was one of the things that when I uh, wrote out the letters you know each letter carries a certain value and um, A, B, C, D, E, F and then next time you come round you get to O and then you get to X all of which are under the, the number six so then there was the revelation references and 666 and, and all that crap so it was, there was a a, a sort of hidden um, element to it, which uh, we were just playing around with, really. And um, it wasn't the uh, backwards playing, devil worshipping version, but but uh, this mixture of sort of Christian and pagan symbolism was, uh, I think, part of that journey. When I first saw it, I thought, um, I wasn't sure about it, to be honest. 
um, if if I'm honest, it looked rather like a uh, a kind of collage of unlikely things. It looked like a number of cutouts. Since then, I've I've come to understand the concept of collage a little more, and uh, I think it works. But at the time, you know, I thought this this is this is just strange. And does it work? And and it, and it had this sort of flat, one-dimensional sort of look because it was collage, I, I suspect. Well, I thought this was the weakest of the album covers he did, certainly at the time. I mean, you come back to it now again, it's rather difficult to sort of to view it as a sort of, you know, objectively. Um, I don't, the sort of the, the, the mockery of the hunt sort of thing, it seemed a bit, a bit of a cliche and everything, you know, I didn't sort of thing. And, and he, it was sort of his idea to kind of do it, to do what he did. And it doesn't really relate to anything on the album, you know. So it was all a bit of a thing, but we, we sort of, we managed to make it kind of make sense by giving the album the title Foxtrot, you know, sort of helped to kind of... Uh, you know, to, to, to rationalise a little bit. But I don't think we were terribly happy with it, to be honest. It was just one of those things that, as a group, we weren't that happy with. I know a lot, a lot of people, other people think it's good, but not so much for me. Lovely atmosphere on Trespass and Nursery Crime. They felt like paintings and they had a nice texture. This felt a little bit, it was okay, but he just put together a bunch of images that were in, in the lyrics, in a sense. I think it didn't really, didn't do it for me. It was a bit weak. Uh, and I guess that's where we changed the next one, I think, actually, you know. Um, trying to move on, in a sense. For me, it was like getting a little bit busy, and I guess that was one of the reasons why we felt, you know, we didn't know that then, but that was the last one that, that Paul Wood did for us. Because I just felt that, you know, that, I mean, Trespass did have a, um, you know, an elegance about it, but and Nursery Crime had, had more, you know, more more butch, but this was just a bit busy, and you know, it was a bit. It looked like it had been didn't look professional for some reason. The, 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 the fox's head lady, you know, well, a figure, anyway, on a bit of ice, is it, and water, you know, it's, it's all a bit dated now. But, I mean, it does sum up, the, it does sum up the album, the period, you know, when you just, sort of, straight away you're there. But uh, what do I think, what did I think of it? I thought it was okay, but uh, not particularly special. <laughs> to wear this uh, UV makeup and bat wings, but it would start the show and in darkness, you know, you'd, and then the UV lights would slowly come on and these big droning chords would uh, appear out of nowhere and then you'd see these two little points of light uh, um, which would be the eyes lit up um, and we had a white back cloth at that time. Well, Peter had started, you know, um, yeah, as I said before, really trying to find things to do on stage and it's developed into wearing these kind of, um, you know, the masks and everything, which on Supper's Ready worked really well. I mean, the, the flower idea was, you know, at the time it seemed a bit crass, but it just worked so well, you know. As I said, it happened at that point I was talking about in Supper's Ready where the music went from pretty to, to silly, you know, and, and he put, he just sort of suddenly said a flower and stuck this thing on his face. And it just, it was, it was a great, great musical moment. A flower? <laughs> If you go down to Willow Farm. Paul Conroy, you know, who was working with us as an agent, and um, and apparently I think Glenn Colson were talking about ways of trying to market this record. And I think Paul got got the music, but it wasn't really Glenn's cup of tea at all. But um, when they saw the uh, cover and saw this fox character, they thought, oh, maybe we should, you know, pay someone a, a few quid and to uh, have them wear a fox head and and then I thought well actually if we're going to do that I should try doing that um, so I took a red dress uh, from my wife's wardrobe was in, uh, she told me since it was a, an Aussie Clark dress it would probably be worth quite a lot now but and um, I could just about get into it um, I put the fox head on and the first gig was actually in this old boxing ring in Dublin, which, while now being a very progressive, tolerant, open city at that point, <laughs> there was a shocked silence when I walked out on stage, um, seeing a man in a, in a dress and in a sort of uh, animal head. Um, was, there was, yeah, a, a visceral sense of shock but you could feel, and I thought, oh, that's interesting, we'll do that a bit more. <laughs> Pete probably very clearly realised that if, if, if you try to run it by the band and get a committee vote on it, we'd all have said, you've got to be kidding, you know. 
Uh, so he cleverly appeared on stage with a red dress and a fox's head. Um, and we all kind of just went, wow. There was a, a ton of arguments about it. You know, and I thought, fuck it, I'm just gonna do it. <laughs> um, you know, because we were always doing this sort of banned democracy stuff. And actually, it wasn't a real democracy because some people were more powerful than others. And um, the more bloody-minded of us tended to get their, own, get their way more often, and as it is in every band the world over. We realised, you know, I mean, that, the, the, the story is that, you know, we did it and we weren't sure about it. We, we, we were happy enough with it in a way, but the next week we, he was on the front page of Melody Makers. We thought, ah, oh, this is interesting. And at that point, the band said, oh, maybe Peter has something. <laughs> uh, perhaps we shouldn't fight him on all of this, because they, they definitely got front page good. People often think it was the other way around, that the sort of thing you know, he was depicted on the cover, but of course he, he just dressed up, which is funny in a way, because we weren't too sure about that album cover, so, you know, but it sort of made sense when he only did it, you know. Uh, it, suddenly he dressed up, turning up like that. And I can't remember exactly what I thought at the time, really. I mean, you know, it was, probably didn't approve to begin with, but then got used to the idea. <laughs> Foxtrot always appears to me to have an album where things took us by surprise, as in Summer's Ready and the end section, you know. And later on in our career, that happened a lot more. But in those days, things were, there were five of us full of ideas. It was a little, little bit of a sort of, um, uh, almost too many ideas going around. So bits like this where things could just happen a bit freer, I think were great. Well, Foxtrot was the first album to sort of, I think, where we kind of sounded sort of convincing to the outside world. I think we sort of convinced ourselves with the, with the first two albums and convinced maybe our fans. And I thought the Link's Upstory just took it on slightly another level where people could hear this album who had never heard Genesis before and, and be interested in it. And, it. and I think that was a significant moment. And it was, as I said, it was a, it was a minor hit. I mean, it wasn't a big hit, but it certainly was sold a lot more than its predecessors had. I would summarize the period as a band trying to find its feet, um, hoping that the record company were gonna renew their contract each album and we were being given the thumbs up to develop very very slowly thanks to um, Tony Stratton Smith who was a wonderful man who signed um, acts who um, he felt passionately about um, and he would give them and us many many albums to to make it it was a very slow burn in those days it was you know there was nothing meteoric about the rise of, of Genesis I was definitely getting to feel like a band, and um, uh, I, yeah, I think Phil was certainly beginning to get more comfortable um, in terms of expressing himself musically, and uh, Steve would be sort of in a, uh, would assert himself, but I mean, still slightly tentatively, I think. You know, there was always this, a holding back element with Steve when I was there, and I think that loosened up, you know, when um, when he went from glasses to contact lenses. <laughs> I have very fond memories. We did most of it at Island Studios in, in uh, Basing Street, and John Burns was the engineer, kind of helped us. And, um, you know, hearing those things and hearing stuff was really put together, and it was very strong, you know. We were actually getting somewhere, and here we had a great album. So, and, and this album, when it came out, did better than the one before, so, so it was um, it was all... You know, power to the people. Yeah. <laughs>